Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mbumi. Um, I am, uh, I am in still, I'm still in two minds about Philemon or Philemon, and so uh, I will continue to switch uh, over uh, between the two, if that's, if that's okay. Um, we have a significant amount to get through, and so we're going to move quite quickly. Um, last week, we started uh, in this incredible book, 25 verses, only 25 verses, but just so much of God's goodness in there and, and, and so many implications for our lives. And, uh, and so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to read it again because I want us to, uh, to constantly uh, have our noses in the text. I said this to you last week. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to bring it and have it open. Look, it's only uh, it's a book with just one chapter, all right? So you're not going to find yourself turning, well, depending on how small your, your Bible is. Um, but, but have it open because, you know, as we make certain points, uh, we want to be able to come back to this book and see where we are getting that from. Um, and so I'm going to read it to us this morning yet again, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump in, and then we're going to move, okay? Is that okay? Yes? Y- yes? No? Yes. All right, great, great. Philemon, hear these words of our father. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Akipas, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because of the hearts of the saints that have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and me. I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very own heart. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you from a brief moment, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me since I hope that your prayers, that through your prayers I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Marcus and Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, We're so thankful that it continues to work in our lives, and so God, would you use it to awaken us to just the wonder and the beauty and the glory of who you are. God, I pray that we would be honest with ourselves this morning, that we would be vulnerable before you. All of us in here are in desperate need of a Savior. His name is Jesus. And so come, Lord Jesus, come. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Now look, last week we we looked at Philemon through four theological themes. We said that there were four theological themes that were present in this book. Now, look, I know there's way more than that, but we, we locked in on four, and then we kind of navigated through 
the book that way. Remember, it was redemption, reconciliation, fellowship, and societal transformation. Now, if you went here last week, I'd encourage you to go listen to the message because um, I just don't have time to do a quick recap. But here's what I want to do today. I want to focus on one of those theological themes. I want us to drill a little bit deeper in one of those theological themes, and that is reconciliation. Right, reconciliation. Now, last week we had a working definition for this word, reconciliation. We said biblical reconciliation, right? I want to add biblical in front of that. So biblical reconciliation is the process of two previously alienated parties coming to peace with each other. Because God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, we reconcile with each other. Right? It's an implication of the gospel. Because we have been reconciled to God the Father, then we are then reconciled to one another, no longer counting our offenses against one another. Reconciliation flows from repentance and forgiveness. I said this last week, and so today we're going to double-click on those. Right? So reconciliation flows from repentance and forgiveness. I also said this last week that this is a supernatural thing. Friends, we have to believe that. That, that this, this the reconciliation is a supernatural thing. I, I don't care what anyone says. That if you want to see genuine, ongoing reconciliation that produces harmony and flourishing, then we need to see the supernatural come over the natural. I said to you last week that we could have the best policies in place, we could have the best programs, we could have the best constitution, and still, still, we will not see the reconciliation that the gospel calls us to. We need the supernatural. We need the Spirit's power to come over us. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what we need. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you might ask, Ane, what is the gospel? I'm glad you asked. I could give you so many definitions. I mean, we could be here for hours unpacking what the gospel is and, and then giving definition after definition after definition. But for, for the sake of time, let me go to a passage that I believe defines the gospel quite beautifully. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. It, it says this, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved. So Paul's setting us up here, right? He's setting us up. If you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, for I passed on to you as most important, other translations say of first importance. I, I love that. What Paul is saying is, listen, there's a lot of important things in here, but, but there's one that is of first importance. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Of first importance, that if we're going to preach anything, then let's preach the gospel. Now, if you, if you believe what he, Paul has just written here in 1 Corinthians 15, if you believe that that counted for you, then the Bible tells us then you will be saved. John 3, 16 says this, For God so loved the world in this way, He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week I also pointed out that reconciliation has an Irish twin. And that Irish twin is long-suffering. Well, another way to say it is that, is that reconciliation requires patience. Reconciliation requires patience. Not like every now and then, every now and then you get a quick fix. But generally, it requires long suffering. And so, in this masterpiece of only 25 verses, we see biblical reconciliation take shape in the lives of two people, and also in the lives of a community. And all of this, all of this, everything that we're going to talk about this morning, all of this is powered by the gospel. 
That's why the gospel matters. Because if we don't know what the gospel is, then I'm telling you, we're going to come up with our own things, our own schemes, our own little 10 steps, hoping that that's what will give us biblical reconciliation. No, it's the power of the gospel. Now, having said that, here's the sermon. If we want to see reconciliation happen in our lives and in our communities, and we do, we do. If we want to see reconciliation happen in our lives and in our communities, then we need to know three things. They, they, they come right out of Philemon. We've got to see three things, and those three things are this. We've got to know that the, that the gospel transforms the heart of the offender into the heart of a repenter. That's number one. Number two, we got to know that the gospel transforms the heart of the offended into the heart of a forgiver. And then number three is the gospel transforms the heart of the observer into the heart of a peacemaker. Right out of the text. So let's look at it. Number one, the gospel transforms the heart of the offender into the heart of a repenter. Now, before we can go any further, we have to ask and answer, what is repentance? What does repentance mean? And I would say, well, great question. Repentance means, watch this, it means choosing God, turning away from our sins, and doing all that we can by the power of the Spirit to keep away from our sins. It's choosing God, turning away from our sins, and doing all that we can by the power of the Spirit to keep away from our sins. It's, 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 it's part of our transformation. It's part of our transformation. It's, 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 it's how God does this work in us where he, he, he takes our hearts of stone and then makes them hearts of flesh. Amen. And here's the thing about repentance. You do this once for salvation. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. You do this once for salvation, and then you will keep doing it as part of your sanctification. Repentance is an ongoing thing. Once for salvation, but ongoing for sanctification. Jesus says this regarding why he came, right? Here's what he says in Luke 5 verse 32. He says, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous. And and let me tell you, this category, this category, very sadly, is very big. Those who think they are righteous. Those who see Jesus as an add-on, as a plus one. Those who go, you know what, I'm a a pretty good person. And so having Jesus, you know, that just kind of takes me to that next level. No, 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 no. You, you are a sinful, horrible, wretched individual in desperate need of a savior. That is who Jesus came for. And so he says, I, I, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. It's those who have been confronted with, with the God of glory. It's, it's those who look and go, I, I see him in his holiness And now I see myself. I need a savior. I mean, Romans 3, don't don't, don't put it up. Don't put up Romans 3. But Romans Romans 3, Romans 3, did you put it up? It's totally fine. Romans 3, verse 23 to 24. Now, I know many of you are familiar with this passage. It says, for all have, don't put it up, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Like, many of us in here know it. If you've been walking with Jesus for a while, you're like, yep, I know it. And you even know that you are part of that all. For all, That's, that means everyone. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, now here's the real question. Does anyone want to know what comes after that? Don't put it up. Like many of us will, will, like, will be like 100%. And, and you're right. And you're, do they put it up? And you're right. And you're right to know it. Right? Like I'm wondering why is everyone looking at the screen? Because you're always in anticipation. You're like, 
I, I actually don't know it. Put it up, put it up. Give me a clue, give me a clue. Like, like you're right to know that passage because it's true for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there's, but there's more after that. So, sometimes I feel like our tribe, like we just, we just sit on that. It's like, well, we've all sinned, all desperate, like what are we gonna do? But there's more after that. Verse 24, put it up, it says, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's the good news. That's the beauty of the gospel is to go, you know what? I recognize that I need a savior and he has come and he has a name and he lived the life that I was meant to live and died the death that I deserve. And the story doesn't end there. That on the third day, he rose from the grave. And that right now he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for me. He's receiving my ongoing repentance. He's molding me and shaping me. But we need to recognize that all of us are in desperate need of that. I say this a lot and I'll keep saying it until Jesus returns or he takes me home. And that is confession is courageous. This world is in, man, it needs some courageous men and women. And let me tell you, confession is courageous. We all need to repent at some stage of our lives. Are we okay there? All right. I have no idea. There's like so many people in there. Everyone's just going. We all need to repent at some stage of our lives. See, the, the, the more you look at God and are honest with yourself while holding on to the gospel, because if you do not hold on to the gospel, it will destroy you. And so the more, the more that you look at God and, and you are honest with yourself while holding on to the gospel, the more beautiful repentance becomes. I didn't say easier. I didn't say easier. But the more beautiful it becomes. We are sinners who sin and we need to repent to God. I cannot put it any more clearer. Now, John Piper says this. He says this. He says we... We repent of our sin. Then it's, it's almost like he goes, oh, now hold on. There might be some people going, but what is sin? Right? We might, we might find ourselves defining it for ourselves and lowering the standard. Right? And so it's almost like John Piper recognizes that. He's like, well, we need to repent of our sin. And then he goes, hmm, but what is sin? And then he goes, let me unpack it. And I wanted to do this thing this morning, but I'm not going to do it. Right? You know, I don't know if you've seen those things on, on social media. It's like, uh, put a finger up if you've da-da-da-da. Put a finger up. You know, we're not going to do that, okay? We're not going to do that. <laughs> do it in your heart. It's the one time here at Jerusalem Fellowship. Do it in your heart, okay? Do it in your heart. What is sin? It is the glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired. The power of God not praised. The truth of God not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed. The beauty of God not treasured. The goodness of God not savored. How are you guys doing? Huh? Because there's more. What is sin? The faithfulness of God not trusted. The commands of God not obeyed. The justice of God not respected. The wrath of God not feared. It has a big one. I was listening to a, 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 a conversation on, on social media. My wife was listening to it and, and, and talking about the American church, but I really believe talking about the church. That there's so many of us, we go, I love Jesus, but you don't fear God. What is sin? The grace of God not cherished. The presence of God not prized. The person of God not loved. And then he says, that is what sin is. And we need to repent of it. Friends, we don't manage sin. You manage your finances. You manage a building construction. You manage your diet sometimes. But you don't manage sin. You repent of it. 
And when you do that, you will quickly realize that there is a loving father on the other side who is ready to forgive and to heal. He is ready to forgive and to heal. And so here's the point. Reconciliation requires repentance from the offender. And the beautiful thing is that the gospel, the gospel transforms the heart of the offender into a heart of a repenter. If, if the gospel, if the gospel demands repentance, then, then what it also does is that it, it transforms the heart of the offender to become one who repents. Let's go to Philemon. You see, Onesimus' return to Philemon shows repentance. If you're trying to figure out where, where do I see repentance in the text, his return to Philemon shows repentance. I, I hope that you see that. You see, we, when we run, Jesus intervenes and then turns us around and then brings us back home. I hope you see it in the life of Onesimus. You see, we, we can also confidently say that Onesimus repented because of how Paul spoke of him. Verse 10, I, Paul, appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. He's, he's going, something, something has changed here. There's, there's been an identity change here. He's not just Onesimus the slave. No, 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 he's my son. I became his father while I was in chains. See, when you repent, there's an identity change. You're no longer an orphan. You're now a child of the kingdom. You're a son and a daughter of our father. Paul says, Onesimus is now, in verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Identity change. Why? Because repentance has happened. This isn't just creative writing on Paul's part. No, no, no. These words are dripping with the blood of Jesus. This, friends, is gospel language. And then he says in verse 12, I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very own heart. He, he, he's saying, Philemon, when you see me as a child of God and one who's been wrecked by the gospel and changed and transformed. He's like, listen, man, the same thing's happened to Onesimus and, and, so, and so I'm sending him back to you, but in a sense, it's like I'm sending myself, my own heart. Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon and refers to him as his own, reflecting his deep love for Philemon's runaway slave. How does God speak of you? Sometimes we can be so focused on where he sent me and what I'm supposed to do and how am I supposed to do, all important things, but, but how does he speak of you? And then we know that when believers openly show love for each other, it, it signals to the world that we belong to Jesus. It's what Jesus prayed in John 17. He's going, listen, I, I, like... When you guys are together and when you love one another, it's like you're communicating something. And so, and so Paul's going, hey, this man's changed. Bring him back. Get him in the family. Look, let me try to make this plain, okay? Let me try to make it plain. Paul is telling one Christian, Onesimus, to go to another Christian, Philemon, who he has offended to go and repent, to seek forgiveness. Why? Because that's what Christians do. <laughs> like who would have thought? He, he does this because he's like, he's like, that's what Christians do. Look, I could write a whole thesis on it. I, I could come up with 25 steps to reconcile. But he goes, no, no, hey, it's, I'm sending him back because that's what, that's what Christians do. I, imagine, Rooster Fellowship, imagine if, if that's what we did. Imagine if that's what the church did. I mean, it, it would eliminate, it would eliminate so much suspicion, so much doubt, so much division. And I'm just talking about the church. See, this man who was once 
a rebellious runaway, always hiding, and he does so out of self-preservation. He is now a child of the, of the kingdom of God. And because he's now a child of the kingdom of God, he now seeks to obey his heavenly father in word and deed. And this, this, this shapes everything that he now does. And reconciliation is part of that. And so he resolves to make amends. He seeks to repent to Philemon. My question to you this morning is, how about you? If you say that you've been transformed by the gospel, if you say that it has changed everything about you, that now you just want to obey our Father who is seated on his throne and fully in control in word and deed, then how about you? You see, you too were once a rebellious runaway, pretending and performing for self-preservation. But God, two of my favorite words in the scriptures, but God, rich in mercy, intervenes, turns you around, gives you the GPS the Holy Spirit, to now make your way back home. And so now, as a child of God, taking steps of obedience towards the voice of the Good Shepherd, how is this changing your life? How do you then view reconciliation? See, often, often reconciliation and again, remember, it's kind of kick-started by repentance. It requires that you have not just a slice of humble pie. It requires that you have the whole thing. This requires humility. Humility plays a massive role in repentance. It's realizing in that moment, it's realizing that you are not the person that you think you are that you have no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, no kindness, no goodness, no gentleness, no faithfulness, no self-control. You are not the person you think you are. See, sometimes, friends, we just need to, we need to put aside, just for but a moment, so that we can just be honest with ourselves. We, we need to put aside our gifts, and dare I say, even some of our theological positions. Now notice, I didn't say the gospel, okay? Before you start crafting an email in your head, hold on. I did not say the gospel. We can never put aside the gospel. But theological positions, gifts, we, we, we'll elevate these things. You see, look, there's some of you, there's some of you, there's some of us <laughs> who speak in tongues but we lie and gossip in English. There's some of us who hold on to our theological positions. I am a conservative, reformed, Puritan. I'm, I'm, we hold on to those things so tightly that we fail to recognize that in that moment they become rocks in our hands and we're ready to stone the very people that Jesus is ministering to. Humility. You see, it's transitioning from, but I, in, in, in a season of conflict, in a, in a season of, of like there's some tension here, it's transitioning from, no, 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 but, but I... And, and sometimes, but I is valid. But most of the time, it's an excuse. We've got to transition from but I to but God. But God. 
You see, but I produces, like I said, excuses, but God produces, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. If we want to see reconciliation happen in our lives and our communities, we need, we need, we need to know that the gospel transforms the heart of the offender into a heart of a repenter. But also, number two, we need to know that the gospel transforms the heart of the offended into the heart of a forgiver. Now, this is a tough one. It's a tough one. But here's the thing. Gospel-impacted people not only repent, but they also forgive. It's, it's part of our DNA. Forgiveness is part of our, our DNA. Look, Paul, Paul encouraged Philemon to receive Onesimus as a brother in the Lord. And then Paul took Onesimus' debt upon himself. All of that, all of that points to forgiveness. See, Paul assumed in advance what we can assume in retrospect today. That Philemon forgave Onesimus. And Paul was, was, was confident of this forgiveness. He, he was so confident. He was like, like Philemon, I know that you'll even do more. In fact, Paul, Paul's so confident. This is how confident Paul is. So confident that he asked Philemon to prepare a room for him to use in a future visit. V verse 22, I'm going to read it from the NLT version. It says, one more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. He's saying all of this to Philemon, and he's like, oh, and by the way, listen, just prepare a room for me. I know you guys are praying for my release, and so I'm praying that God will answer that, and so I'll show up. For, for the sake of time, let me take you by the hand and walk you to the implication of what Paul is saying. J Jesus should be so confident that we, as Christians, forgive and reconcile with one another that he will show up at your house unannounced, knock on the door, walk in and expect reconciled brothers and sisters. <laughs> Who's not opening? Let's be honest, right now, right now, if Jesus showed up right now, who's not opening? Uh, look, among, among the, the, the many lessons we can discover from this example, here, here are at least two. As we talk about forgiveness, here are two to consider, okay? Number one, we as Christians should know, we as the church should know that forgiveness exemplifies. Forgiveness shows. Forgiveness embodies. Forgiveness characterizes. Forgiveness personifies our faith. See, Paul expected Philemon to forgive. Why? Because Philemon knew the forgiveness of God through Christ. And because he was deep in the gospel. That's what Paul was counting on. He was counting on the fact that Philemon was like, listen, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And so he's going, great. I don't have to work you through the steps. I don't have to build a strategy for you. I'm counting on the fact that you say that you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. That, that God, through Jesus, has forgiven you. And so therefore, you will do likewise. Paul, Paul writes this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. He says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, if you are a Christian, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you are part of the chosen ones. Congratulations, you're in. As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, he says, put on. Put on. Put on. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has grievance against another. Put on. Notice he doesn't say put on preaching. 
and, and me, I love preaching. He doesn't say, put on the gifts. Put, no, no, no. The, the fruit of the Spirit is here. Put on. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. I mean, that, like that alone, we should be able to say, okay, it's a sermon on forgiveness. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Amen. Go home. See, a, a failure to forgive contradicts one's faith. And, and may sometimes, watch this, and may sometimes show no faith at all. Some of y'all are like, is this, I didn't know Richard was this kind of church. There is a danger that many of us, many of us are running in. And that is the assumption that we have been saved. Because my parents were Christian. Because I grew up in the church. Because I've gone to every single Bible study. Because, because I know the songs. And all of these things are incredibly beautiful things. Many of them steps of obedience in your journey as you grow in your faith. But, but if someone was to ask you, how, how are you a Christian? You say, because I repented and trusted and put everything in the hands of Jesus because I am in desperate need of a savior. And God sent one. That's it. And there's many of us, there's many of us walking around here with, with unforgiveness in our hearts. And yet we say, no, but me, I'm for Jesus. Be careful. I don't have time, so I'm going to give it to you, and then you're going to go home and you're going to read it. Okay, be a good Berean. Go read the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35. If, you, if you're sitting here going, mm, oh, no, that's, you're a little bit too harsh, no problem. Go read Jesus' parable. Okay, so forgiveness exemplifies our faith. But, but the other thing that we should take note of, the other thing that we should consider as we talk about forgiveness is that forgiveness sets you free. Yeah. Forgiveness sets you free. Paul, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, speaking to the Christians in Corinth. He says this, I'm not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Okay, so he's dealing with a situation. Someone has hurt a bunch of people. That's what's going on here. He says, most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. It's time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. Verse 9, I wrote to you as I did to test you and see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man... I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. So that Satan will not outsmart us. Uh, too often, too often, I feel that he's outsmarting us. He's dancing all over us. And then he writes, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Are we? Are we? I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Pastor, um, you know, I've, I've seen lately these dark magic board games. You know, is, is that demonic? Uh, tell me, please. Or, 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 you know, is the throwing of bones and sticks and, and, and rocks and all that, is that demonic? You know, please tell me. I'm, I'm feeling this evil. Let me go ahead and tell you. It is evil. It is demonic. If you are doing it, stop it in the name of Jesus. Do you know what else I'd like to add to that? Unforgiveness. You see, if you, if you don't forgive, Satan gets an advantage in your life. Unforgiveness and bitterness will give the devil access to your life like nothing else. B bitterness and unforgiveness, hear this friends, bitterness and unforgiveness often, often masquerade in our lives in a statement. You guys know it? 
I'm fine. Okay, maybe, maybe I need to do it better. Let me get in character. Hey, in light of so-and-so, I realized that X and Y happened. Now, how's, how's that going? No, I'm fine. Well, you, you need to tell your face that you're fine. Because all of us can see it that you're not. It, it's a saying that we like to, 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 to use in our house. It's like you're eating lemonis. You've got lemons in your mouth and you're just like, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, no, I'm okay. No, you're not. We all know that you're not okay because you're holding on to bitterness. You're holding on to unforgiveness. Friends, this is how serious unforgiveness is. Jesus says this regarding it. Mark 11, 24 to 25. He says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it'll be yours. But when you are praying, the but matters. Because some people like to like, no, no, that was one point, finished, different point. No, conjunction, but. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive you your sins too. some, Some of you have unanswered prayers because you have bitterness and unforgiveness in your hearts. Why is that thing not, not being unlocked? Why, God, why, why is the thing not happening for me? Why is that door not opening? Why is then this really? It's because you're holding on to forgiveness, unforgiveness and bitterness. Here's an here's a, here's a old one, but it's a good one. Okay? Bitterness is like drinking poison. You know it? And hoping the other person dies. How ridiculous is that? And so you drink an enormous amount of it, hoping the other person, like, and here's, here's what makes it worse. When the other person continues with their life, there you are drinking, ah, how could you, how dare you, ah, I'm right, you're wrong, ah. and the person's going, life's great, <laughs> look at me, guys, everything's good. Root of Fellowship, stop pretending and performing. People ask me, why do you say that all the time? Stop pretending, stop performing, because we're great at pretending and performing. For self-preservation, we are really good at it. So stop, stop pretending and performing and just lean into the gospel and its power to release you, to release you from bitterness and unforgiveness. Just lean in. Be humble. Be courageous. Confess, just say, hey, listen, I, I'm not in a good spot. Because when you did X, Y, Z, or because they did this and that, and here's, here's what it's doing to me. Like, I, I realize that I'm actually holding on to unforgiveness. I'm holding on to bitterness. See, when you, when you don't forgive, you allow the devil to sink his teeth into you. And he wants to drag you out. He wants you isolated. He wants you alone. And then he wants to throw you around like a dog plays with a rag doll. And then he eventually wants to drown you spiritually. Keeping you from all joy and all life that is found in the gospel. We have an enemy and he hates you. He doesn't have a misunderstanding with you. No, 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 no. Your brothers and your sisters, there's a misunderstanding. Satan hates you. He is fully aware of his hate for you. And he's hoping that you are not fully aware of his hate for you. So that you might buddy buddy with him and tell yourself, I'm managing this. I have this under control. I'm going to put the stuff on my face. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. They're going to know. We know. Because maybe you could do it two, three weeks. But after a while, there you are. Mm. It's like women want to ask, like, does something smell? I think it's my heart. Needs cleansing. Matthew 6, verse 
14 and 15 says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse, and in here there are people with degrees and honors and masters and PhDs and experience. And so we have ways of manipulating the word refuse. I didn't refuse. I, I am just... No, 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 I'm not refusing. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive you your sins. Guys, do we, do we, do we believe these words? Because sometimes we live like we don't. We, li- we live as if God is like, no, 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 no. So I was just playing on that one. I was just messing around. No, like I'm not really good. No, he, your father will not forgive your sins. And so friends, hear me. You have been set free, forgiven. So live as one who is free. Forgive. Okay, let's keep going. So where are we? Where are we? We've got to move. If we want to see reconciliation happen in our lives and our communities, then we need to know that the gospel transforms the heart of the offender into the heart of a repenter. The gospel transforms the heart of the offended into the heart of a forgiver. And then the last one, we need to know that the gospel transforms the heart of the, of the observer into the heart of a peacemaker. Yeah, that's good. This, this is the message of the whole book of Philemon. The, you see, the transforming work of the gospel is not just happening in the life of Philemon and Onesimus, but the entire community is being impacted. Good. We, as we read it, are being impacted. We are not just witnessing what is happening, but we are, we are being invited to participate. And we do so as peacemakers. Friends, we are in the business of biblical reconciliation. And what the church did, so sad, so sad in this nation, is what the church did is it, it went, okay, we will hand that over to the government. And then we'll hand it over to the institutions and we'll hand it over to the communities in the suburbs and we'll hand it over to people who will go and study this and come up with really great ideas. We are in the business of biblical reconciliation. Look, last week I read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And, and I talked about the great exchange, the, the redemptive work of the gospel in our lives. And so this morning, permit me to read a little bit more broadly. Let's begin in verse 14 of that same chapter. Hear these words of our Father. For the love of Christ compels us, since we have reached this conclusion, that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Gospel. Verse 16. From now on, then, okay, here's some implications of what we've just read. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him this way. Paul, what are you saying? Let's keep reading, okay? He'll tell us, therefore, ah, there we go. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us, watch this, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, I love, Paul's just going, listen, I know, before you ask questions, just wait. Because we're all going, the ministry of reconciliation, oh, what is that? That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, okay? So if God's not doing it, be careful, we don't and has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, there's a lot in here. But if we're going to understand it, I think we have to ask and answer the question, what is an ambassador? I quickly searched online, and here's a really good definition. An ambassador is a diplomatic agent of the highest rank. What is higher than being declared holy, chosen, 
useful child of God. A diplomatic agent of the highest rank and is sent to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his or own government or sovereign and is appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. I don't have time, but there is a whole sermon here just in that definition. But the point I want to make is that you have a special assignment. All of us do. If you are in Christ, you have a special assignment. Well, what is it, Oneh? I'm glad you asked. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. If you're wondering what should be the loudest thing from your life, be reconciled to God. When you show up at the office, be reconciled to God. When you show up in the community, be reconciled to God. We boldly declare this from the position that we have been reconciled to God through Christ by faith and faith alone. This is why God is making his appeal through us. I don't get it. I don't get it. If I was God, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have chosen you. You guys would have not been plan A. I'm just telling you now. But aren't we thankful that I am not God? And so in grace, he chooses us. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my appeal through you. That is the assignment. We, among so many other things, we are ambassadors of Christ, given the message of reconciliation. And so when Paul engages with Onesimus and, and learns of his situation with Philemon, he, he clothes himself with this beautiful kingdom duty, and then he gets to work. He, he thinks to himself, if I could be reconciled to God and then reconciled to my brothers and sisters after all the things that I have done, then surely, surely Onesimus and Philemon can be reconciled. Is that the posture of our hearts? Or do we consider ourselves outside of the power of the gospel? Or do we think of some who are just beyond the grace of God? Church, we are peacemakers. And this, and this peacemaking work has implications on our lives. It does. This peacemaking work has implications of our, on our lives. And we, and we see some of them in the book of Philemon. I don't have time. We'll get into all the other little practicalities next week, so come back next week. But, but, but let me give you a few of these implications. Here, here we go. Number one, a peacemaker display, displays a readiness to engage and get involved. I mean, hopefully that's an obvious one from the book of Philemon. A readiness to engage and get involved. Paul gets stuck in. There's none of this, mm, it's confidential. You know, that situation, very private. I'm sorry, I don't know why I do this voice. I don't, I don't know where it's from. I don't, trauma, to, I, I don't know. I'm going to try to change it up, all right? Hmm? No, he gets stuck in. He recognizes what's happening between two brothers in the faith, and he goes, no, 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 no. Let me close myself, because I know, who, let me get in. Number two, a peacemaker or peacemaking is often a messy situation. It just is. You, you will have to navigate emotions and false narratives, hurts and offenses, trauma and pain, and sometimes hardened and unwilling hearts. It's a messy situation. Sometimes it will feel like you're a, a referee in a, in a heavyweight boxing match, but in this situation, expect some punches. It's a messy situation. Number three, being a peacemaker is a costly matter. I mean, verse 18, it says, and if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I'll bear the cost. It's going to cost you something. A peacemaker, here's another one, a peacemaker demonstrates and embodies a profound understanding and respect for the parties involved. I love that one. It demonstrates uh, and embodies a profound understanding and respect for the parties involved. Look, our best example, I could take it to so many people, but our best example is Jesus. Thank you, Tiamo. 
I think that was you. Amen. (laughs) Jesus is the best example of this, of one who demonstrates and embodies a profound understanding and respect for the parties involved. Anya, where do you get that from? I'll show you. Jesus does this when he's reconciling us to God the Father. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 to 16 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. We're being told here that we have a high priest who goes, I get it. Like I know in here there's situations where we're like, yeah, but you don't understand. Okay, yeah, no, no problem. Let me take you to the one who does. And you know, there's a difference with him. He's gone to where you have gone, but he did not cross over. That's a different kind of understanding. It's one who goes, I, I, I felt as well. I also wanted to. But I did not. I get it. I get betrayal. I get abandonment. I understand failure, frustration, tension. Jesus gets us. And then we go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, all the way to 11. I won't read all of it, but it says this. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when it had come, uh, come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And then God goes and exalts him. But it's in that beginning part where he goes, you know what? I get it, but I'm not going to take advantage of it. I'm not going to exploit it. I know what it means to sit on the throne to have everything created out of me. God, I get it. I get it when they have sinned against you. I understand. Jesus gets the Father. You see, Paul had won the respect of Philemon and Onesimus. How how do we know this? Well, we should consider what he's asking of them. He's, He's requested a runaway slave to return to his master. The fact that Onesimus entertained this request indicates his considerable respect for Paul. And then likewise, when Paul pleaded with Philemon to welcome back his slave with kindness, it shows that he too values Paul. Paul had respect of both Philemon and Onesimus. And however, he did not exploit that respect. As a peacemaker, he aimed to mend the relationship between these two brothers. That's what we do as peacemakers. Here's another implication. And the band can come up on this one. We're almost done. Peacemakers have the right motivation. Peacemakers have the right motivation. I mean, why did Paul want to get involved in the first place? I ask myself that often. As, As I navigate through this world in this time, knowing that I am an ambassador, that I have been given the message of reconciliation, that I am a peacemaker. What, why? Why would I want to get involved? Why did he stick his neck out and run the possibility of being a victim of pain and rejection? Because if you've done any peacemaking work, you know. You know you're going to sit there in between the two parties and it's going to be like, hmm. Doesn't, doesn't take too long before all of a sudden, and yeah, on as well. I'd like to, whoa, wait, whoa, wait, wait. I wasn't even there. Yeah, you know, and then I think you. So what is the motivation? He could have easily said to himself, you know what? Not my problem. <laughs> it's not this thing. It's not my problem. I wasn't there when it happened. I, I, I don't really know the intricate things of what's going I don't know. I, I wasn't born in that time. It's got nothing to do with me. It's so easy to say it's not my problem and then maybe even just blame personalities. Ah, you know, you're an Indiagram, what, what. 
I N G T A W X Y Z. You want? I don't know. Like we just. It's so much easier to do that. So what motivated him to be a peacemaker between Philemon and Onesimus? Well, verse 20 tells us. It says, yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. He did what he did because of Jesus. He was in awe of the, of the richness of God's mercy and the depth of his grace. Paul just wanted to please the Lord. He wanted to do this thing that I like to call grace, grace. It's like putting on two pairs of shoes. Grace, grace. You take one step, grace that I've received from the Father, and then the next step, grace that I extend to others. Grace, grace. My fear is that many of us are hopping on one foot. No sacrifice is too great when we are doing something for the Lord. For he paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. And then lastly, a peacemaker is hopeful. A peacemaker is hopeful. What we read in Philemon, powered by the gospel, should make us hopeful people in light of reconciliation. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I have often struggled with this one. And many have shared the same with me. And it's, it's because of the, the horrific reality of when reconciliation does not happen. This can be so overwhelming that we become discouraged and Christian pessimist. Is that how you say it? Pessimist. All I know is that it's an oxymoron. You can't be a Christian and be pessimistic. I mean, look at what Paul says. Here's how hopeful he is. He says, since I am confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is a hopeful man who's leaning into the power of the gospel and he's like, I know what Jesus can do. Living evidence of what Jesus can do. And so even as you think, as you think about your own situation, as you think about maybe a, a, a dynamic with parents and a, and a dynamic with siblings and a dynamic with a colleague and a dynamic with someone, as you think about it, are you hopeful? Paul is hopeful because he knows these two powerful truths. He knows that God is powerful enough to bring even the most hardened sinners back to himself. And can I tell you someone? No one is more hardened than you no one has lied more to you than you no one has betrayed you more than you and yet God brings someone like you to himself the other thing that Paul believes is that he's like this it's the same God who's in the business of reconciling divided separated indifferent Christians to one another he is in the business of doing this Another way to say it is that God loves to do this. He loves to see marriages reconciled. He loves to see families reconciled. He loves to see individuals coming back together and sitting and fellowshipping together at the same. He loves to see this. And so the question this morning is, do you believe that he does? Really? I'm not talking about just intellectually knowing, but do you believe? I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here. I know, fully knowing, that there are, so, there are so many questions here. I know that. There's so many questions here. And I'll talk about them next week. In fact, there's so many reservations. Some of you are sitting here going, yeah, but honey, you don't understand my situation. I know. I know it. There's so many misconceptions about forgiveness. I know it. Maybe we'll title next week's sermon, Forgiveness is Not, okay? Maybe that'll entice you to come back. So we'll talk about it next week, but, but I'm going to leave you with this. Friends, if we want to see reconciliation happen in our lives and in our communities, then these three things must become the soundtrack to our lives. That the gospel transforms the heart of the offender into the heart of a repenter, that the gospel transforms the heart of the offended into the heart of a forgiver, and that the gospel transforms the heart of the observer into the heart of a peacemaker. And so Rooted Fellowship, will we get to work on this? 
Will we get to work on this? Ruja Fellowship, what is our response to this? You know, sometimes I wonder, I wonder if, if we truly believe this, how many of us would be on our knees going, you know what, I, I know the situation in my life. I am the offender. And I'm covered in shame and in guilt and I don't know if I can, if I can, if I can repent. Of, I don't know if I can even declare that I did something like this. Not me. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're the offended. And you're like, oh no, you don't know. You don't know. I don't. But the one who is seated on his throne in heaven does. And so maybe you should be on your knees, face to the ground, saying, I am in desperate need of the power of the gospel to give me the ability to forgive and release. And then for us who are sitting here going, you know what, we're witnessing all of this, get in the game. Biblical reconciliation is what we do. And it'll only happen, hear me, it'll only happen if Jesus is at the center of everything that we do. And so Father God, we come. I wanted to say asking, but God, we're pleading. We're pleading. For you to move in this place in such a powerful and profound way that all of us, all of us would find ourselves at the foot of the cross recognizing that we are in desperate need, not just in our personal lives, because that's, that's where it starts, but we're in desperate need. Our society needs you. So many of us around, around us where we live, work, and play have just given up. We've just given up. That, that maybe reconciliation isn't quite a thing of the gospel, or maybe it's just a thing that happens between us and you. God, I pray against that lie. And I pray for an awakening to happen in this place. That we would be able to boldly, boldly call people into reconciliation. But God, if you need to do a work in us, then would you do that right now in this very moment? We're going to stand and we're going to sing. But God, if you need to work in some of our hearts, then would you do that? Holy Spirit, take a hold of us and do business with us. We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.